crowdsourced air quality sensors. Motorized scooter companies still insist that safety is their highest priority. A crazy drop shipping web nightmare. Ads in our baby registries. And Jason has the new Pixel Slate. We'll see how it compares to my iPad Pro. All that and more coming up on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 59, recorded Thursday, November 29th, 2018. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Privacy.com. Stop using the same card number everywhere. Use Privacy Virtual Cards and get a $5 credit off your first purchase. Learn more and sign up in under a minute with your debit or checking account at Privacy.com slash TNW. And by DigitalOcean, the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash twit. And by LastPass, secure every password protected entry point to your business. Join over 43,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is the show where every week we talk to the people making and breaking the tech news. That's right. I'm Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. We, uh, we've had a, quite a couple weeks, you know, well, over the weekend, things have cleared up. We've got mm -hmm. a lot of rain coming through. Mm -hmm. Why is that important on a technology podcast? I'm going to tell you right now. California, as you already know, has been ravaged by wildfires in recent weeks. The devastation in both Northern and Southern California made international news. Thousands of homes that sat in the path of the fires were lost. Many people still unaccounted for as search and rescue operations continue their efforts. Now, during the peak of the wildfires, residents in the surrounding areas, ourselves here in Petaluma included, watched as the air quality shifted dramatically towards extremely unhealthy levels. So, so much so that uh, it closed down schools, warnings were issued to keep residents indoors, minimize breathing and ingesting the, all that toxic air. As the weeks progressed, one site called Purple Air became the destination for those seeking insight into the unstable air quality uh, conditions. The CEO and founder of Purple Air, Adrian Dybwad, joins us right now to talk about these dramatic events that have happened in a big time for your company. Welcome to the show, Adrian. Hello, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so great to get you here and thank you for taking time to talk with us. So uh, Purple Air, I would say is relatively new. You guys started in 2015. Talk a little bit about the genesis of the group, why it uh, came together in the first place. So um, we started when uh, this gravel pit that we we lived near this gravel pit and we saw dust blowing out of the gravel pit every day over um, Bluffdale, a, a city near us. And I would just wondered how much dust there was. And so you were like, all right, well, let's start a company and we'll we'll measure all that dust and we'll create hardware around this. I mean, it's you guys have done a lot in a couple of years. Um, and then this is translated into, of course, how Purple Air kind of came across my attention was this map that gets populated that I, I feel like so many people in this area were referring to on a daily basis, definitely, but almost on an hourly basis to, to check in and make sure what the air quality uh, is in the area during the fires. What exactly makes up those data points that are seen on the map? So those data points consist of everyone who has a purple air sensor and um, is basically uh, wanting to take part in monitoring the air quality. So I know that you use the EPA air quality index, um, also known as the AQI scale. I learned all kinds of things just recently. <laughs> uh, but what do the numbers themselves recommend? What do they represent? So the numbers represent the uh, AQI. Uh, it's an EPA scale that um, has been derived out of um, what effect it has on your health. They are based on 24-hour averages, so we represent them in real time, which is, um, you know, if you were to stand in that air for a whole 24 hours, then it would have that effect on you. But it's it's like an early warning telling you that this is what it is and uh, that it, it's, you know, dangerous so the numbers are like the particles in the air like per million or 
Right. So the, the device actually consists of a laser counter that, that detects the number of particles suspended in the air, and then it works out what it estimates the mass to be of all those particles. Uh, and that is then converted into the AQI number. So, all right. So this is this map is constructed uh, around the sensors that you that Purple Air creates and that that people buy. Who who who's buying these sensors and what do they get? Like, why are they buying them? Are they buying them to feed that information to you for a greater kind of public awareness or explain that a little bit? Right. So most of the people that buy our sensors are interested in air quality. They want to help contribute towards uh, helping clean the air and uh, raising awareness to air quality issues and they're interested in it for their own health and so they put a sensor on their house to help them to um, determine when to let their kids outside, when to go exercise and whether they should have the doors or windows open or closed and, and just in general um, to look after their own health. So uh, as we were talking earlier, I, I thanked you for all the hard work that you've been doing. But and you said, um, you know, really the the thanks go to the people who have these sensors. It's really a, a crowdsourced operation because I, I use the website, but I don't have a sensor. Was it that always the plan to have crowdsourced uh, to to crowdsource all the people that have the sensors and use that data? Yes. Yeah, so the idea always from the beginning was to share the data. Um, it's basically the idea is to have data that's freely available. You don't have to log in, you don't have to be a member, and you don't have to pay anything to use the data. Some people that buy a sensor, they say something like, well, why should I pay you to, to get a sensor and then give you all the data? Well, our answer to that is that you are getting everyone else's data as well. Mm -hmm. So there's huge benefit in sharing the data. And, um, you know, it, it gives you the ability to compare now and, and also not just in this country, but between different countries. So you can know what the air is like compared to England or India or Australia or other places in the world, too. So um, in our, our uh, technical director, Josh, was showing the map just a few minutes ago. And I noticed in the Bay Area, like everything's really clean now, right? Like this like single digit numbers, whereas, you know, at the height of the fires, you know, everything was red and purple and it was like 250 and above. And it was just it was crazy town. Um, yet when you look at the map right now, surrounded by all of these green dots, there's those occasional ones that are elevated. Are those... Like, what, w what would you explain around some of those? Like, this one's 82, whereas everything's immediately surrounding it. There's tons of uh, fours, essentially. Are those inside of a building or, or next to some sort of a plant that's polluting the air? What, what would you say about that in general? Right. So, so the ones that are reading high when everything else is green is exactly a point source. It's uh, If it's indoors, it's indicated by a black ring around it. So you can determine those oh. separately. But um, that makes sense. the you, if you're living next to a pizza place that has a, a wood fire, fired stove or you're living next to a restaurant that's got, you know, like some, some restaurants make smoke come out their chimneys so that people can smell the food, you're going to be picking up those types of pollutants. Wood-burning neighbors, uh, industry next door, anything like that, that is a point source that is not intense enough to affect further away, but it's affecting right there by you. Hmm. So I know uh, these are, this is an IoT, a, like a smart home device. How easy it, is it for a normal person to install one of these sensors? We have a, right now um, a little bit of a mixed experience. Like some people have an easy time of it, some others don't. It's, it's really, we try to help those that don't have an easy time, but you, it's pretty easy to configure. You connect up to it using Wi-Fi. You then tell it what your Wi-Fi details are and it connects to your Wi-Fi and transmits data um, to the internet. So um, it's easy to mount. It's e you just need an outlet and you need the Wi-Fi connection. And as, as far as these sensors are concerned, I mean, obviously, these are going to cost a heck of a lot less than the instruments that are used by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, what you guys are doing here involve uh, laser technology, from what I understand. How does that differ from the other more expensive instruments uh, used by the U.S. EPA? So the EPA also does use laser counters in some of their devices. They also have another type of sensor that's called a gravimetric sensor that uh, will draw air through a filter and then weigh the mass of the particles that are caught on the filter. So they're actually weighing the mass of the particles. Here we are counting the particles and estimating how 
you know, their, their mass based on an average density of particles in the wild. So sometimes that, that's a bit different if you've got wildfire smoke versus gravel dust. Gravel dust is heavier than wildfire smoke. And so if you're using an average mass to measure wildfire smoke, you're going to overestimate it a bit. But it's still going to be a case of if it's a, a, you know, purple air, it's going to be pretty bad air. Um, and the EPA, they also calibrate their laser counters um, fairly often. So they will um, calibrate them according to the type of pollution and uh, the, the um, other factors um, probably twice a year at least. Uh, we don't do that. We don't have the ability to do that. Hmm. So how much do the sensors cost? Uh, from about $230, uh, we also offer discounts to group buys or to um, individuals or groups who who uh, have reasons for needing a discount. Mm. And you mentioned that the, the indoor ones have a black circle around them. Why would someone put it indoors versus outdoors? Right, that's a very good question. You spend most of your time indoors, or a lot of time anyway, and um, so you're exposed to air that's also trapped inside your house. If it's bad air, it tends to stay there and last longer than, than uh, it might. And so knowing what the air is like inside gives you the opportunity to clean it out, to either open the doors or windows or get an air cleaner, a HEPA air filter um, works really well, the cheap ones that you get from Walmart or wherever. Um, and then um, it just enables you to also compare your indoor air quality to others in the area if you share it publicly. That's the motivation for sharing it publicly. So uh, it tells you where you are relative to other people. Obviously, you know, a company wouldn't wouldn't like plan or want to be in the right place at the right time when the right place at the right time coincides with something that's like such a disaster as what has happened with the California wildfires. I have to imagine, however, that this ha that your company existing in the last couple of years and this kind of uptick that we're seeing or at least per perceiving in wildfires, just as one example here in California. Um, I mean, how how is that affecting your business? Are you are you noticing a difference, a visible difference between what you're offering, the interest around your product, and everything as these changes are happening around the world? Absolutely. Um you know, bad air quality draws people to our site. Um, someone sees it and then they tell their friends and next thing you know, you've got a whole lot of people on it. Um, you know, you guys are talking to me because of the uh, wildfires recently. And, you know, it's we get a lot of people saying thank you for the service because we help them to avoid the bad air or to go somewhere where there's good air. And, um, uh, you know, we had a 100-fold increase in traffic on the website over the last few weeks with wow. the California wildfires. Another example is the volcano down in Hawaii. We had a huge increase in uh, visitors from Hawaii and purchases of sensors in Hawaii with that. So basically any bad air quality events throughout the world can drive people to our site. And it's kind of unexpected. I would have never said to you a couple of years ago that, you know, wildfires in California are going to make people need our, our service. But um, it's really refreshing to be of use and to be helping people because we get quite a few emails saying thank you. I mean, and that's really, really it right there. And that was kind of part of the reason, like, as I was reading through things, you know, post after the fires, you know, I, I made that connection where I was like, man, you know, we've relied on this site. And before this happened, I knew nothing about Purple Air. So, you know, I, I just want to say thank you as well. It was really helpful to a lot of people that I know in, in my direct circle, let alone everybody else that was referring to it that, that came across it. So, um, Adrian, really appreciate you taking time and uh, for creating everything that you've done uh, with Purple Air. We just want to thank you for coming on today. Well, well, thank you. And we look forward to making things better. And uh, we look forward to helping people in the future. Awesome. Adrian at purpleair.com. We'll talk to you soon, Adrian. Best of luck. Bye. Guess what? What? Scooters, the ones lying on the sidewalk. Oh, yeah, I They know are disrupting our bones, oh, apparently. great. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, privacy.com. You don't use the same password everywhere, so why use the same card number when you shop online? Privacy.com generates a brand new virtual Visa card number for every purchase you make online with just one click. It's easy. Simply download their browser extension from the Chrome Web Store or their Android or their iOS app and then link your virtual cards to your U.S. checking account or your debit card. Freeze and unfreeze cards, and you can also set spending limits per charge. That's nice if you have kids. You can uh, set spending limits per charge, per month, or per year. With privacy.com, never worry about being billed twice or upgraded without your consent. 
Here's what I like most about privacy.com. I like to try new apps and new subscriptions all the time. Sometimes, occasionally I forget to cancel them. Instead of worrying about paying for something I don't want, I can use privacy.com to do that work for me. And if you're worried about getting a refund because you don't have that card anymore, don't worry about that. If you've closed or paused the card, you can still get a refund. Refunds will still work for you. If you're a smart consumer, you probably want to know that you can also get up to 5% cash back. That's a pretty good deal for a free card. Did I say that already? It's free. Privacy.com is 100% free to use. Virtual cards are locked to a merchant, so you don't have to worry about changing your card everywhere. If one gets hacked, you'll get a decline email or a push notification if the hacker tries to use the card elsewhere. You can even figure out when merchants uh, likely got hacked, often before they even know themselves. The security of your data is at the core of what privacy.com does. They're PCI DSS compliant and they're held to the same security standards as your bank. Sensitive information is secured using military grade encryption. Information is encrypted using split key encryption with partial keys held by separate employees. No single person can access the sensitive data on the server because it requires multiple keys to decrypt, like the nuclear launch codes in war games. And true to their name, these cards let you use any billing info you like so your information remains secure and private. Privacy.com believes customers should have full control of their data so they provide their customers access to transaction data via a webhook API. And they support two-factor authentication. Right now, it's only available in the U.S. Sorry, my friends outside of the U.S. Just like credit cards, they make money from merchants so they won't sell your information and there are no hidden fees. Privacy.com has saved customers over $100 million in unwanted and unauthorized charges due to compromised cards, hidden fees, and forgotten subscriptions. Protect your privacy and your money with virtual cards from privacy.com. To learn more and get a $5 credit off your first purchase, visit privacy.com slash TNW. That's privacy.com slash TNW. And we thank privacy.com for their support of Tech News Weekly. Motorized dockless scooters, they look pretty fun, but doctors are reporting an alarming uptick in scooter-related injuries. Dara Kerr from CNET spoke with some of these doctors, and she is here to tell us what they've been seeing. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So a lot of people will just say, if you don't know how to ride a scooter, then don't ride a scooter. But some of the doctors and the patients that you spoke to said it wasn't their fault. Tell us what happened to Pat Brogan in San Diego. Yeah, so Pat told me what happened to her. Um, she rented one of the scooters. That she had rented them a couple of times before, but maybe only once or twice. And she started going and went for about half a mile, and then she came to a big hill. And as she started to go down the hill, her scooter sped up faster than the speed it normally goes, which is 15 miles per hour, and then the brakes wouldn't work. So she had a pretty bad crash. She broke her hand, um, had a hematoma down her leg. And, and she's, she's really lucky because the other accidents that are happening are far more severe. Wow. And so I know that when we, you know, when you click through those apps, you give away all your rights to sue. But if it's really, I mean, if it's really their fault, um, if there's something broken on the scooter, is it, is it really, I mean, can they, can the company still say, oh, not, you know, you signed this thing? Yeah, exactly. The company can say that because when you click um, the agreement, when you sign up for the app, it um, it has a whole list of things that you agree to. And one of those is that all responsibility for what happens on the scooter is on you. And that includes um, mechanical failure. Wow, that blows me away. So so then, I mean, I'm sure they also, even though they're, they're placing all of that responsibility on the rider, uh, I'm sure they still don't want their their reputation tarnished with the fact that, oh, that, well, yeah, their bird scooters are always messed up or their brakes always go out. How often, how frequently is an active supply of, of scooters on hand? Are, are they tested for safety, for quality control, that sort of stuff? I'm sure they would want to know these things ahead of time to avoid any problems, even if the, the user is kind of on the hook for it. Yeah, the companies definitely don't like this the fact that accidents are happening and they're but they're pretty quiet about what they're doing um they definitely do test the scooters lime told me they do rigorous testing on all of their models um but you know the scooters are being left outside all day yeah. um, they're being vandalized all over the place and so a lot of times people don't quite know what they're stepping onto. 
Yeah, and I mean that's that's the big challenge right there. Like rigorous testing is is great, and I'm sure they do that when they first put it out there. But once it's out there, I mean that's the wild west. Anything can happen to them. I, I mean, yeah. I've seen videos of people throwing these scooters around, you know, in complete disregard for for the the mechanical aspects of it. Who knows if something has been or even sabotaged? Like that could even happen, and yet oh, the, yeah. the user, the rider, is going to end up being the one on the hook. Definitely, I did a story a couple months ago about. Um, scooters being sabotaged and people going around and clip, clipping the brake cables oh and goodness. the brake cables are, you know, they can be down at the bottom of the scooter and that someone might not notice that those are out. Oh. Wow. So you say that doctors are saying as many as 10, uh, 10 injuries a month, sometimes 10 injuries mm -hmm. a day from scooters. Yeah. How yeah. many did doctors say, how, how, what percentage, about what percentage of these could be avoided, the injuries, if people just wore helmets? Well, so the injuries that are really serious are the ones, the head injuries, and those are the ones that involve people not wearing helmets. Um, so the amount of very serious injuries is less than the, the you know, a thousand, according to my estimates, a thousand a month. Um, a, a small per percentage of those are head injuries. Um, but those head injuries are really, really serious. The doctors that I spoke to said uh, people were you know, in for lifelong care with these injuries. Oh, wow. And so aren't helmets, le like what's the, le are helmets legal? I, I thought they, I mean, I thought it's illegal to ride any scooter without a helmet, at least in California. Is that accurate? Well, it's, every state has different laws. Um, in California, currently under state law, it, you, it is um, the law that you have to wear a helmet but obviously not a lot of people follow it. And interestingly, last February, Bird, one of the scooter companies, uh, um, backed a bill that would get rid of that helmet law amongst a whole bunch of other things. They also wanted to allow for scooters on sidewalks and for speeds to go up to 22 miles per hour. A lot of that was stripped away, but what was left from that bill was um, not people not having to wear helmets and that did pass and it was signed by the governor. Wow. So starting February, or starting January, that people will no longer be um, obliged to wear helmets in the state. They will no longer be required to. So, and then, and then, what about other pedestrians? Like, obviously, you know, these scooters, whether they're meant to be on the sidewalk or not, people are definitely riding them there. I'm sure police in some of these big metropolitan areas have much better things to do than than to police some of these things on a, on such a, a regular basis. But um, if an, a collision happens with a pedestrian, who is on the hook there? Is it again? Is it fall on the rider of the scooter to say, hey, yes. you're the one that coll collided with them. That's your responsibility. Yes, it will definitely be on the rider of the scooter. And a lot of lawyers I talked to said, you know, then there's these two people and they have, they're, you know, both facing big financial issues and the, the companies have no responsibility. And there's even crazier is say you're a pedestrian and you trip over a scooter on the sidewalk that's left there. <laughs> the responsibility for that accident will be the last person who rode the scooter. Oh my God. Oh my <laughs> That's really, yeah. So, so, but nothing bolts that scooter down to the ground when, when a person puts it off the side where it's safe, like literally anyone can move it. Right. So yeah. That's exactly. unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. Well, the other unbelievable thing is, and you say in your piece that Lime will mail you a helmet if you ask them. Yes, both wow. Lime and Bird mail helmets to people, yeah. And Bird said it's mailed 50,000 helmets so far to people who've asked for them. But then it, does, it doesn't show a way to like bring it on vacation with you or, you know, just or yeah. just have it generally. That just seems like a, you know, let's just spend some more money so that we can look good kind of thing. It, uh, <laughs> it was criticized <laughs> as a, you know, a kind of PR campaign when they did that, but that, you know. Who knows? Well, yeah. if Amazon could get a drone to drop the helmet on right at the scooter, <laughs> then maybe that would make more sense. Yeah. That's that's actually a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that happening. <laughs> um, so, so what are the, so the, the scooter companies are basically what are they saying? I mean, when they must get really tired of you guys talking to them and asking them these same questions. But what, what are mm -hmm. they saying about this? About the accidents? Yeah, like about their responsibility. I mean, it's it seems to be growing and growing. I mean, this is yeah. just such a. It's I don't know. It's it's a it's a popular story. I think it also just reflects mm -hmm. our time where we're all sort of angry at tech companies and their disregard. Yeah. But this is like our physical health. So what are they mm -hmm. saying? 
So the companies over and over, they say the same thing every time. Safety is our top priority. Um, they do, you know, they have stickers on the scooters saying the different rules that people should follow and to wear a helmet and ride safely. They have videos you can watch. They are doing some PR campaigns um, around riding safely. A lot of this has actually been spurned, though, from regulators as cities um, regulate the scooter companies and and the laws around them. So a lot of regulators are saying that they won't allow them in the city if, unless they do these safety campaigns. And so we've had like shareable bikes for a long time. And they, they mm -hmm. is it, are bikes safer or people just aren't riding them on the sidewalk? What's the difference? I didn't do a, uh, a lot of investigation into safety and accidents around uh, the rentable bikes. They There are a lot of bike accidents and there are a lot of cars that hit bikes, um, those numbers are really big. It's kind of hard to compare because we don't actually know how many scooters are on the street and compared to bicycles. Well, Dara, thank you so much for joining us. Dara Kerr is a senior reporter for CNET covering the on-demand economy and t tech culture. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. After, after the break, let's uh, go down the weird rabbit hole of an Amazon seller's offering, you know, things like hemorrhoid cream, pet slings, and religious books, just to name a few random items. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean provides the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications uh, using droplets. It's virtual machines that are a scalable compute platform with add-on storage, security, and monitoring capabilities. You can choose from standard or CPU you optimize droplets and customize from there. And DigitalOcean is really at its core, it's designed for developers. So there's an easy to use control panel and an API that lets developers spend more time coding and less time managing all of that infrastructure stuff. Industry leading price to performance, access the compute resources that you need at the lowest rates. And that's going to save up to 55% compared to other cloud providers. And you'll always know what you're going to pay per month there's a flat pricing structure across all data center regions to keep it easy. Uh, included at no additional cost, along with everything else, you get 99.99% uptime SLA, cloud firewalls, monitoring and alerting, full DNS management, uh, global data centers, enterprise class SSDs, and easy to use API, as I mentioned. Over 150,000 businesses, including some of the world's fastest growing startups, rely on DigitalOcean already, and that's to remove their infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. So sign up today and receive a free $100 credit. All you have to do is go to do.co slash twit. That's do.co slash twit, and you'll get a free $100 credit, and we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Tech News Weekly. After reading our next guest's latest piece in the New York Times, I felt totally overwhelmed. I had to literally take a nap, and I'm using the word literally correctly. Artist, writer, and resistor of the attention economy, Jenny O'Dell, welcome to the show. Hi. So I first heard you on Reply All, the podcast Reply All. You were talking about your investigations into those weird Instagram ads for like free watches that have a fancy name that makes you think like you live in San Francisco or something. But your story in the New York Times this week goes so much further into this weird world of uh, s selling stuff online. Everyone must read it. Uh, we can't possibly do it justice here, but let's try anyway. Uh, tell us how the story mm -hmm. started. Um, so probably the way that it started was the weirdest thing about it, um, which is um, I had so I was teaching an internet art class um, at Stanford, which is where I teach art, and um, a student of mine who knew about my previous research into like semi scammy dropshipping type businesses um, just happened to mention that his parents, who live in Palo Alto, were getting. Um, packages delivered to their house that appeared to be like returns to um, a company called Valley Fountain LLC, which they had never heard of. Um, so that's really where it started. was just like something that my student um, casually mentioned. Um, and then basically from that, I mean, it's, as you said, it's a bit hard to summarize. It's a really long piece, but um, from that package, um, looking into like what Valley Fountain LLC was, which was very difficult, um, I eventually came across an address that included Valley Fountain, but 140 um, LLCs, other LLCs. So um, I kind of, at the point, it always seemed very weird to me. I had no idea how weird it was going to get. 
um, and then just kind of like going through them, finding patterns, like starting to notice one name a lot. Um, and then somehow, honestly, this part, I like don't even remember how I was able to figure out that um, the LLCs were each associated with an Amazon storefront. Um, and the LLCs had very strange names. The storefronts also had very strange names, but they were unrelated. Um, and it's pretty surreal. Like some of the names are like, you know, Bro Pastures, LLC, um, <laughs> or uh, Giggling Eye, another good one. Um, and they all have sort of consistently low stock. Um, so like it often says there's only three left and they have really long delivery time. So it seemed to me like they were probably... Um, had no, they had no inventory and someone going and, and buying something on the storefront is then getting something shipped to them from another re, another Amazon seller um, where it was not as expensive. So to test that out, I, I did that. So I went to one of the storefronts and I bought some lipstick that seemed very expensive. Um, and then you sort of midway through the story, you'll see that I, I got it. Um, but it came with an invoice from another Amazon seller where it was like, you know, half the cost that I had paid. So someone sort of turned around and ordered it for me and then had it shipped to me. Which you explain in the article is drop shipping is, is kind of the term around this is, is drop shipping. Is that illegal? Is it just unethical or, I mean, are there, are there ethical ways to drop ship? <laughs> yeah. So I, I do, I mentioned drop shipping, I guess I, I would make a distinct, so drop shipping is not illegal. It's, it's widely used. Um, it's, it's also involved in that watch piece that I wrote, which is, um, in that case, also not really illegal. Um, I guess it's a bit weird, maybe, for people who are used to the idea of someone having inventory. Um, the distinction I would make between, like, kind of traditional drop shipping and what happened here was that um, this is really, like, drop shipping, I think, normally means, you know, somebody has a relationship or is ordering things from say like a supplier in China and then you, you go to their site, you buy something, maybe you thought they had inventory or, or a brand or something like that. And then they have the things shipped directly to you from say overseas. Um, this I think is much weirder because it's somebody just, you know, going to another Amazon seller and having right. that shipped to you. So it right. seems a little bit, a little bit weirder. <laughs> I think so much of this story relies on just our distraction, like our inattention. I mean, I think yeah. like I, I have definitely like just bought something quickly on Amazon or like ordered it through my Amazon Echo and not checked prices. But a lot of what you talk about is like stuff that is way overpriced. And if you just spent one more second, you would realize, um, I mean, how much of, of your research did just, did you realize that like all these people, um, you know, they're, they're not doing anything illegal, but they're definitely taking advantage of how little uh, the rest of us are paying attention. Yeah, that was definitely a big part of it. Um, it's something that, you know, I have friends who are investigative journalists and I admire their work so much because I think it is about this um, taking the time and spending, um, you know, having attention, paying attention to a set of information for maybe like longer than is usual, which is shorter and shorter now. Um, and I find, I mean, at least with this piece, like there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Um, a lot of the sites that I talk about that are um, not necessarily fake, but there's something definitely weird going on, um, which also happened in the watch story that I wrote. Um, it's not hard to see at all. I mean, you can look at this site for three minutes and you know something's wrong. Um, and then it's just a matter of like seeing that over and over again across like a span of different locations or instances. And then you kind of start to get a sense of it. I'm not saying that it didn't take a huge amount of time and like crazy diagram drawing um, and attention for me to figure this out. But I do think the kind of threads to pull on are kind of everywhere. And it, um, it doesn't actually take that much to notice those things. I, I love that you mentioned the diagram drawing because as I was reading through this, cause it's so is so detailed and it's so confusing when you try and follow those threads. I kind of envisioned you with one of those walls from like, you know, the, the, the crime TV shows drawing the <laughs> strings in between things and wait a minute, you know, light bulb moment. Um, at at yeah. one point in the article, you talk about a storefront. So we, we like to think of these things as happening in the digital sense and there is no like physical brick and mortar place, but there actually is in this case. And you mentioned how kind of disconnected the experience was there. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think probably the, the weirdest example of that is the bookstore um, that I talk about at the end that it's sort of 
um, it's a real bookstore. Um, and some people who uh, read the article have, they realize they've been to that store and for them, it's just a bookstore. Um, but, uh, and then there's also, yeah, this, this department store in, um, in New York that is, again, um, it is a real store. You can go there and, and buy things. Um, you might, again, find that there's something a bit weird about it, um, or it's kind of a strange assortment. Um, but in both cases, these are um, things that sort of popped up. I, In my opinion, um, kind of, they were reverse engineered by things that were happening online. Right. Um, and also in both cases, they're, um, well, in, in the case of Stephen's books, there was actually a it is a store in North Carolina called Stevens Books. So it, it might start out being something actually normal, brick and mortar, and then it's taken over. And then there's this weird stuff going online. And then you get this kind of weird zombie version of it in San Francisco. Um, so going to that store was, yeah, very disorienting because at that point, when I went to the store, I had already done a lot of the research for this story and, um, and you know, what Stevens Books actually is, which is a bit hard to say also. Um, <laughs> And like, you know, coming across this guy that runs the store and has kind of two different identities on Facebook, um, uh, knowing all of that and then going into this store that, you know, I, I live in Oakland, I don't live in San Francisco, but it's basically in my neighborhood, right? Um, and, and this idea that you could just walk in there and not, not have any idea that it's actually connected to, you know, this church and this Christian university and um, by extension, like this whole network of um, kind of strange connections between businesses and, and the church. Um, it kind of made me a little bit crazy for a while, um, maybe paranoid. <laughs> like, just like what, and the same thing happened to me when I was researching the watch because I was actually shopping for a watch at the time. I was just like, I don't know what's real anymore. Um, who knows? Like maybe everything is a front for something else. <laughs> So there is sort of, the, there is like this Christian college, possibly cult. I mean, they've been indicted. Um, how much of that is involved in this? And, and I mean, do you think it's just really the, even the, the, the Christian ch church, this, this particular uh, Christian university was also a front? Um, I don't know what's going on with Olivet <laughs> University. I think a lot of people agree that something weird is going on um, and it seems like it's getting a lot of coverage and I really look forward to seeing uh, what comes out in the future. <laughs> um, but I thought it was really interesting that they framed their relationship with these Amazon store funds as like cultivating this entrepreneurial spirit among their students um, and comparing it to research driven universities like Stanford and I think Cornell, the other one they mentioned. Um, so um, yeah, definitely something something weird going on, um, and and I think it's being actively investigated. Something's not right. Um, I I don't really get totally to the bottom of it in my piece. I think my my piece is more about just this kind of like the phenomenological like experience of like what like where am I like yeah. what is this stuff. Um, <laughs> that's that's the fun of reading through the article top to bottom is is uh, following that breadcrumb trail with you and 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 seeing where it leads to and and I think we were probably just as confused as you because I mean <laughs> no matter how hard you try to make sense of of this web and understand exactly what's going on here uh, it's it's really difficult to do I'm curious about. Your students, uh, it was it your students' parents who were receiving all these packages. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, th this company or, or whatever it is, this web of companies doesn't really care about getting these products back. Like, did that house just become like a graveyard for random products that nobody actually wants? Like, what do they do with this stuff? Um, they didn't do anything, to my knowledge. I think they just like, were accumulating in their garage, basically. <laughs> and I think they, um, they eventually complained to the, the post office and it's no longer, luckily they are yeah. no longer receiving these packages. Um, but something, I think it's not really mentioned in the, in the article, but I did notice that, um, these, so these LLCs often had, um, two or three addresses. Um, and so one would be 235 Montgomery, uh, and then one would be, uh, an address that when I looked up all of those, they were virtual office addresses. So, you know, like if you are, you have a company and you want to seem like you have an address, there are these virtual office addresses that you can register. Uh, and then in this case, it was the third address. It was unfortunately my 
my students' parents' house, <laughs> unfortunately for them. Yeah. So you it. returned the lipstick. Did you ever get refunded? No. <laughs> You're like, I did not expect <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> so, so no money, no lipstick. No yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just crazy. I mean, it's like if you, if you started the fact that like Amazon now has – uh, you know, actually, as Amazon sponsored brick and mortar stores, it's not even like, you know, that weird that but just the fact that you, you the way you talk about how it re, you know, they re re and reverse engineering these stores into real life. It's bizarre. And we haven't even mentioned that, like, Newsweek is also part yeah. of this story. And, you know, as you mentioned your piece, like your boyfriend worked for Newsweek. Can you just yes. real quickly explain how Newsweek features into this whole story? <laughs> Yeah, that was a very surreal moment because I, um, while I was researching that piece, I would often just like sit on the couch and then become glued to the couch for many hours, like researching. So I was there and at some point I, um, you know, I, I found this all of that university connection and then that sounded familiar to me because I'd heard about this, um, their connections to Newsweek, the Newsweek media group. And at that point, uh, my boyfriend, Joe, was like in the next room. Um, and I was like, Joe, <laughs> can I ask you something? Like, it was just a really strange, like, like I said, at the beginning, it already seemed very surreal. But then when it, it started to open up and become even more surreal, but also like strangely loop around to something connected to my life was like very, very um, disorienting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's another thing that seems to be like it's actively being investigated is this connection between all of that university and, and Newsweek Media Group. Um, something that you'll see a lot in this article is there, um, there are two addresses that things all seem to kind of collect around. Um, so like, and they're both in New York. So there'll be like, you know, Newsweek related things and, and all of that related things. And then this uh, companies, these Amazon storefront related companies all kind of collecting around these addresses. Uh, which is very strange. And uh, something that I since found out um, that a couple people told me about after I uh, wrote the piece is that 33 Whitehall, which is the address um, that I mentioned, has to do with one of the kind of online stores, um, as well as some other things, is where the Newsweek offices were very abruptly moved to in August. So kind of interesting detail. <laughs> so many question marks yeah. here. Well, if anything, it, it just made me feel better about all the, all the rabbit holes that I've gone down and yeah. felt like it was wasted time. But obviously um, it's art because Jenny says it is. So <laughs> <laughs> Jenny <Absolutely>. Odell <laughs> teaches internet art and digital physical design at Stanford. She's been an artist in residence at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Facebook and the Internet Archive. Her book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, is slated for publishing in April 2019. And of course, go to the New York Times, read this piece. Uh, we have not done it justice. So you, it, it's just amazing what is just out there really hiding in thin air. And uh, you've done the research to, to see it all. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Yeah. If you, like me, have just woken up from your Black Friday, Cyber Monday hangover, then maybe it's time to discuss the somewhat deceptive ad practices of a place you've probably shopped this week. Joining us to talk about the present state of native ads on Amazon is Rolf Winkler, technology reporter for yeah. the Wall Street Journal. Hi, Megan, how are you doing? <laughs> Good, welcome to the show. So, uh, Thanks for having me. Your piece with Lauren, Laura Stevens caught my eye this week. Uh, Amazon has been sneaking native ads into their baby registries. What can you tell us about these ads? I can tell you that what happened here was that my wife and I are expecting, our oh. in-laws created a registry for us and we noticed three items in there that they hadn't included and we hadn't included. They looked odd and we looked a little closer and it said sponsored. Um, and because we're investigative reporters here at the Wall Street Journal, went back and found out and they actually have for at least the past year had a program where advertisers can pay to uh, insert native ads inside a baby registry. Wow. Okay, just real quick, did, did you notice them? Like it was your registry, were you looking over and you're like, hey, there's a sponsored thing in there? Or did somebody that was on your registry notice the sponsored? How, how did that recognition them. come from? I, I personally noticed them, yes. And you saw the sponsored call out, which, I mean, if you're looking for it, it's obvious, but if you're not, it looks just like everything else. Yeah, yeah, they even have like the zero of one purchased in there. Right. Which is important language to point out, Megan. It's good you, you flag that because the language zero of one purchased 
as experts mentioned to me, gives you the the, inst- the 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 it suggests really that the person who's created the registry want wants this. They want one of these things, right? That's the standard language in a wedding registry and a baby registry. Uh, I want zero. I, I want one of these diaper genies, right? Mm-hmm. So please buy one of these for me. Or as you're showing on the screen right now, I want uh, one of these Johnson uh, uh, ba- ba- uh, bath discovery baby gift sets, right? Um, but you know, if you're not really Primed. This is basically the way those read across on desktop. There were three uh, items in each row reading across, and then probably in this particular registry about uh, 40 or so total items. So um, if you're really looking for that little gray sponsored right there, you can see it. Um, but as I, when I spoke to experts, they, even they couldn't, they didn't see them unless I pointed it out. It's amazing because it almost feels like these, you know, uh, they, they're just trying to push as far as they can go. And I feel like they, they went too far with this because, because you know, usually when you see a sponsor, something sponsor, you might click on it. Like we might have all done that at some point, but like we make the choice to buy something that we think we want. But this is so obviously like, you know what you put on that registry and what you didn't put on that registry. I mean, it's, I mean, there's a good chance that maybe like you put, you know, pampers and they put more pampers on there or something like that, that they're hopefully they're trying to suggest things that you might want, but what you put on your baby registry is very specific. And most people would probably know if they got something, but I guess they're just hoping that they, that the person maybe went off the registry and just bought them something right. and then, you know, just said, Oh, well, probably so. Uh, Megan, you raise a very interesting point there. And one, uh, an expert we spoke to said, this shows Amazon, uh, pushing the envelope, it, it, you know, once they've locked you in with something like Amazon Prime, they are now trying to experiment with uh, all the other ways that they can wring revenue out of this great uh, website that they've built that we all now rely on. Yeah, no kidding. How many advertisers like are are able to get involved in this particular type of of advertising? This this particular sponsorship that you know of. Now, none, because when we called Amazon for a comment, uh, it took them a, you know about a day, and they came back and they said, actually, we're phasing this out. <laughs> so we're constantly experimenting, and this is something that's in the process of being phased out. They didn't answer my question when I said why they sold ads this quarter that are being phased out. Um, but that's, another, uh, that, that's, a, that, that's something else to deal with before they decided to phase it out. There were three ad, ad placements at once, um, and each ad placement cost uh, $500,000 per quarter, and advertisers addition, had to spend additional money on advertising on Amazon in order to lock up the native ad slot in the baby registry. And, and w- was the idea there, uh, as far as you know, that everybody that's doing these registries, that these ads would appear, would be would receive the same product recommendation or the same like company's portfolio, a single product from their portfolio? Like, how were those selected? That's not entirely clear to us. We do know that at the moment, the three products that were up there were uh, Playtex Diaper Genie, Huggies Diapers, it's Kimberly Clark and uh, a Johnson & Johnson bath time set. Right. There appeared to be a couple different Johnson & Johnson products that had appeared in that sponsored unit spot uh, over the past few months. So it's possible they were mixing and matching a couple things. Yeah. So what do other baby registries do? How do they handle it, like Target and stuff like that? When you open a registry on Target, on Walmart, on Bye Bye Baby, which is Bed Bath & Beyond, it just starts blank. That's it. So they're, they're not doing this. They were not, no. And what's interesting is that Amazon also does have a unit where you can suggest items, right? You know, these are suggested items that you can add if you like. Um, but this was more than that. This was uh, also putting, you know, it's, it's almost as if you walked into, say, you walked into a grocery store and you pick up a basket, you pick up your shopping cart, and there's already three things in it um, waiting for you. And so then you get to the register um, but also not like that because if I walked into the grocery store and I saw three things in my shopping cart, I'd know they're there and yeah. um, it'd be very easy for me to take them out. Here, uh, it's, cl- it's clear that a lot of these actually remain in the shopping cart, whether it's because people saw the ad um, or because some people, look, some people said, uh, you know, it's, I, didn't buy, I didn't mind it. It primed my brain for what I thought I needed. 
So some people do say that, um, but really it's unclear how many kind of keep it there because they saw it and they like it. Yeah, I think that was one of my big questions too. Was was uh, I know as you know at this point we have we have two children, and when you're going in initially, when you're when you're waiting that you know you're expecting your first child, there's so much you don't you you understand that you don't know uh, that you might be missing. So to a certain degree, I could kind of understand filling in the gaps a little bit. Maybe the sponsored side of things kind of makes it very, a little bit, you know, uh, makes me a little hesitant about it. But as a new parent, I might actually appreciate, oh, you know, I didn't actually think about that. Maybe if it was a little bit more sincere, though, the sponsored aspect makes that a little bit muddier. I think. Mm -hmm. what, what, was that a question? I apologize. No, no I think it was just a soapbox. It was, it was, a, it was a baby related soapbox. Um, so, okay. So they're not, um, th this isn't technically illegal. Like the FCC wouldn't say that because they have the sponsor tag that that's all they needed. Right. You'd have to ask the FTC that um, they aren't the the types of people that are going to comment, get in the business of commenting on particular ads. I can't call them up and say, Hey guys, what do you think of this one? Um, are you going to have a problem with it and go create some sort of enforcement action? That's not how it works. Um, what I can say is that with search engines uh, in particular, who have over the years sort of changed the labeling of the ads that appear at the top of search results, the FTC has said, hey guys, you know, once upon a time, you highlighted these ads, you put them in boxes that were on the side, you did all of these things that made it very clear to a user that they were ads. And now what's happening is, you know, little gray sponsored text at the top of Google with product searches. And also, you know, when there are ads in actual search links, there's a little button that says add, uh, and it's the same color green as the URL right next to it. So it may be harder to see. Um, it used to be a bright yellow button next to that that said add. Um, and before that, the whole thing was highlighted at one point. So they've clearly gone in a direction where the FTC has said to them, uh, hey guys, here are suggestions so that these things are easier to see for uh, for users. Now they haven't actually responded to FTC's suggestions by making any changes. So I guess it would really be on the FTC to decide whether they need to enforce their rules. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so frustrating. Are these ads in like the regular wish lists? Like Amazon has had wish lists forever. Are there adverts ads in there too? Our reporting showed that this was unique to baby registries. So there weren't, for instance, any uh, native ads inserted in wedding registries. But those are really the two things that, that we looked at directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, and it, that uh, to me is so frustrating because, um, you know, obviously you could say like, well, just don't shop at Amazon. But that's getting harder and harder <laughs> these days <laughs> Feels that for way. me anyway. Yeah. And but you could also I mean, it, it's just it. it the baby registry is so specifically because you you know like as a, I mean I'm I'm my kids are 15 so like I think I know everything about what uh, you know new parents might want for their babies and obviously I don't but like that's what they're counting on they're counting on people like you saying like oh well my mom must know better than me and she bought this um, and that's sleazy that's not a question if, if, if you think so <laughs> I, I I would tell you that one thing that one of our uh, one of the people we spoke to in the story, he spotted this a year ago in his own registry. He happens to be a user experience web designer. Um, so he thought he had a very specific, very informed opinion of, of what, what he'd seen there. Um, I asked him, I said, look, okay. He, he said he was very frustrated. He felt tricked. Um, and he said, look, this is friends and family spending money on stuff we didn't ask for. Mm -hmm. And I said, Brian, would you have put your register, knowing this, knowing now what you know, would this have changed where you decided to register? And he said, no. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody's got Amazon. They've got an Amazon account. Most people have Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. So it's just too easy to set up uh, a registry on Amazon and just get gifts from there uh, simply and easily. So I, I don't uh, foresee that this would change a lot of people's behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, it's free to get at Target a red card, and that's free shipping as well. You don't even have to pay the Prime. And they, you know, they have the same stuff, but that, you know, that's me again, giving my advice, not a question. Uh, Rolf, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for staying steady as the, you know, Wall Street Journal uh, reporter does and not taking any of our, not, you know, climbing on our soapbox with us. We appreciate that. Well, Rolf Winkler is a technology reporter in the journal's San Francisco Bureau. His primary focus is venture capital and startups, and you can connect with him 
him on Twitter at Rolf Winkler. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rolf. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Talk it. Soon. After the break, Jason finally has his Pixel Slate, and he's going to tell us all about it. Uh, I'm going to find out if I need to trade in my iPad Pro for the Pixel Split <laughs> Slate. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you I I'm not going to. But first, I want to thank LastPass, our sponsor, LastPass. Now, you probably already use LastPass if you watch this show. You've heard us talk about it. If you use it, then... Uh, why doesn't your office use it? You should convince, if you're the person that gets to choose whether your office uses LastPass or not, convince them, uh, convince the person to use it. LastPass Enterprise makes password sharing convenient for employees while keeping access to corporate data secure. It even allows for full customization of access, including the ability to set master password requirements, enable password resets, and restrict access when needed. You can configure over 100 policies. You can access security reports and create shared folders. You can organize database logins, SSH keys, software licenses, and business information. And you can further protect your business with multi-factor authentication. With the LastPass Authenticator app, a verification button pops up on your phone or uh, your employee's phone, and that will guarantee that they're the only ones with access to their accounts. If credentials are compromised, the app ensures outsiders will not have access. The LastPass password generator makes it easy to use unique random passwords that employees don't have to remember or write down. Employees can log into LastPass with their Microsoft Active Directory credentials so they truly only have one password to remember. Data is encrypted and decrypted at the device level. Data stored in the vault is kept secret. It's even secret from LastPass. They have easy onboarding, uh, password autofill. Password autofill is my favorite. I used to I used to cut corners with LastPass. I'll admit it. Um, on my iPhone and my iPad, I didn't didn't always use it because it was hard to fill. But now it is easy to autofill. It just appears right there in your um in, on your phone, and you just press it, and it's it's so nice. And I even use Face ID, which is great. LastPass makes it easy for businesses to take control of passwords and to reduce the threat of breach. And like I said, iOS 12 and Android P autofill functionality makes it easier for employees to seamlessly use LastPass across mobile devices. When you open up an app or visit a mobile site, the keyboard itself will offer your username or your password as an autofill option. That's similar to how uh, autocorrect looks like now. No more copying and pasting from your LastPass app. LastPass also offers LastPass Premium for personal use. LastPass families for your entire family and LastPass teams for teams of 50 or fewer. More than 16 million people trust LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit today. That's lastpass.com slash twit and see which product is right for you. Guess who got their hands on the new Google Pixel Slate? Well, yes, that would be me. I got it yesterday. I'll be honest. I've been using it for the whole show, as you've mentioned. Uh, this was probably not too much of a surprise. Maybe you noticed that it's not the uh, the Pixel Book like I'm normally using. I uh, figured we'd take a, a quick first look on this because I literally unboxed it yesterday, and I've been using it you know, at home a little bit. I've been using it here, obviously, for the shows that I've done today. Uh, I also happen to have, so this is the Pixel Slate itself up top here. I also happen to have the Pixel Slate keyboard accessory that it's attached into. Um, but you're, you're saying that it looks just like an iPad Pro, right? It does. I wish I had brought my iPad Pro, um, but I used it for about a week and replaced my MacBook and then I gave up and went back. But um, but it's got some things that the iPad Pro doesn't have, like some really important things like multi-user support, right? Like, Well, yeah, Chrome OS has multi-user support uh, kind of baked into there. You can kind of see there's the, the latest version of Chrome OS on here. I've used Chrome OS on a tablet uh, before months ago. I think it was uh, an Acer more made for the classroom environment. Mm -hmm. And it was prior to Google doing the update to Chrome OS to make things a little bit more touch friendly. You know, a, lo a lot of the kind of UI elements uh, seem more kind of touch happy. This is probably going to look pretty familiar to you when I go into there. You know, that kind of has an iOS kind of uh, iPad feel to it. Um, so they've, they've definitely made changes to the OS to make it more conducive for a touch uh, environment because the Pixel Slate is in essence, a tablet, a Chrome OS tablet that also 
you know, can, can uh, snap into the keyboard dock to become more of like a productivity environment sort of tool. This is the 799 version. It's the Core M3 version. I wanted to get the, the i5, but they were sold out and we just wanted to get one in-house. So I went ahead with this. Eight gigs of storage, uh, 64 gigs of, uh, of internal storage, eight gigs of RAM, sorry. And obviously it's kind of the two-in-one form factor. Uh, I would say that they opted for tablet first, mm -hmm. which I mean would be the same with the iPad Pro, right? Yeah. Um, I think the challenge there is that I'm not entirely convinced that Chrome OS, even though they made changes to make it a, a better tablet OS environment, I'm not sure that they're there yet. Mm -hmm. And so some of the like dock editing and, and control in the tablet form factor that I've tried, and I end up kind of running into roadblocks that are frustrating, mm -hmm. you know? So hopefully over time that'll be improved. Can you do multitasking like on screen, like two windows open in the same screen? Yes, absolutely. So I can go there, I should try and not get any of the reflections. So this is oh. kind of the multitasking area. I've got the different, the different menus. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. Uh, I'll go ahead and take the IRC chat and move it over there. Uh -huh. I'll take the dock and move over there. And it kind of does some scaling to make it all fit just a little bit better anyways. Yeah, the iPad can do that. I mean, a lot of people complain about the iPad not having support for USB-C hard drives. I, I don't necessarily do that, but I guess the, the Slate, you can do that. You can hook it up to a USB-C. Yeah, absolutely. So there's two USB-C ports, oh, on, nice. one on each side. So depending on how you want to plug it in, that comes in handy. And then uh, from what I've, I haven't tested it out myself, but from what I understand, it has really good support for plugging in devices, be it storage mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, external monitor or whatever, whatever you want to do. It has really good support for that. Um, so that's going to come in handy. Now, as you can see, uh, you know, it's got a couple of, uh, stereo speakers on, on each side. Uh, it does have a fingerprint sensor up at the top. So that's an extra layer of security. You just go boop and it lets you right in, uh, front facing camera. I think that's eight megapixel as well as a rear facing camera up at the top there, but, uh, I'm probably not going to use that that much. And then of course the pixel, uh, slate keyboard, which is another $199, kind of expensive, but it just snaps right in, switches over to kind of the the version that's more ideal for um, for kind of the keyboard layout. So things have kind of minimized a little bit and everything. And uh, then the keyboard comes into play. And I have to say, like, I like the the action of the keyboard. I feel like the touchpad is, is nice. It's got a little flex to it because it is oh. kind of a, a, a flex cover or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that can potentially get you into problems because with the flex cover, um, the touchpad can actually register a click if, if you're not careful. So, and then the way it works on the back, if you can kind of see, it's that whole magnet style where it snaps into place here. But the beauty of that is that it can literally be anywhere oh. on the entire back. So if you want a steep kind of setting or if you want it to, to really scale backwards, you've got the whole length of the, of the tablet to do that with. Is it worth $200? I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. And I mean, like, like I said, I've literally used it less than 24 hours. At this point, I've, I've encountered enough kind of uh, stumbling blocks with it that I'm, I'm not convinced that it, I'm ready to replace the Pixel Book with this, considering what I use them for. Mm -hmm. um, but, I'm, but I'm willing to you know, spend some time with it and check it out. So this is definitely more of a first look than anything. Just kind of, hey, take a look at the hardware. But I mean, it's nice. It feels really nice. It's mm -hmm. a nice piece of hardware. Um, I just don't know if, if Chrome OS is there yet for, for its tablet support. I just had a brilliant idea. What's that? And like last year, I'm going to suggest it on the air so that you can <laughs> um, not really have an opportunity to say no. Oh, okay. When we do the switch, we should switch the iPad Pro and the Pixel Slate too. Like switch the phones and the tablets. Uh, wait, so we're doing the switch again? Yeah. Well, first of all, we do it every year. We won't do it for six we weeks. Do. We can even okay. do it for three weeks if you want. Okay. I don't care. Time yeah. is up to you. You get to decide the time. But I think we should oh. switch. All right. Um, uh, I'll give you my Apple Watch. Oh, okay. You'll give me, I'll yeah. wear nothing because yeah. there's no That's equal. And we'll I do switch anymore, but um, phones yeah. and tablets. We'll do the, the Pixel 3. Yeah. Uh, you can enjoy your night sight mm -hmm. uh, mode. I think you'll like that a lot. I think that's a great idea. Yes, yeah, we'll switch, do that. Yeah. And I'm happy to pick the time so that it okay. won't be six weeks again. <laughs> my seconds. goodness, six weeks was a long time. Um, 
Well, yeah, I uh, I think it looks like, and you said it, you, we said the price, right? It starts at seven hundred ninety. Oh well, this version is seven ninety nine. I can't. I, this isn't the lowest version, so I can't remember how how far down it goes. But that's it is start at five ninety nine, so you can get a low spec. You're probably going to want more than that, though. Um, it's it's worth stepping up. That those are seller on uh, processors in there, and I mean, at some point you're going to run up against that, even though it's just Chrome OS. Mm -hmm. But does um, it have a pencil? You can get the pencil. It's an extra accessory, and it works very well with the screen. I do not have one. I don't really use it for much of anything other than going, ooh, it works. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, why is that an essential um, component for you? Do I have to pick one up so that mm -hmm. you can have one to use? Well, I'm use? not going to give you my new Apple pencil if you don't oh. give me... I'm just going to keep it out of spike, even though it doesn't work with anything except my iPad. <laughs> I'm just going to mount it on the wall in front of my computer. So every time you come into the room, you see it there yes. hanging and not exactly. being used. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, then I guess I have to get one. Okay. Uh, we'll talk more about this another time. Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live. You can be a part of the show by emailing us, tnw at twit.tv. Hey, subscribe to the show. You know yeah. you like it. Twit.tv yeah. slash tnw. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Uh, and if you want to tweet at me about really anything, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Uh, everybody here in studio really worked their tails off today. <laughs> thanks to Berg. Thanks to Jammer B. Thanks to Josh. Thanks to Alex. Uh, thanks to Colleen. And thanks to everyone for watching uh, this episode of Tech News Weekly. We'll see you all next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>